Um, first of all, thank you. I want to thank everyone for the, uh, our, for your patience and the sudden change of platform. Um, <laughs> for joining us in general for the first webinar uh, in the Indian Energy and Minerals Forum. Uh, this is an introduction and a state of affairs for carbon-based tribes webinar, co-hosted co with Sagebrush Hill Group, who will be moderating today with their president, Mr. Derek Watson and Mr. Steve Gray, who is board chairman with the Four Corners Economic Development Group. Uh, for those who are, do not know me, um, I am Michelle Littlefield. I am a program coordinator with the United States Energy Association Consensus Program. Uh, just a little note about our program. Uh, we are formally named Building Consensus on Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage, CCUS, and Clean Coal Technologies. Uh, we call this Consensus for short. Uh, this is a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy and Fossil Energy. Um, our job is to uh, educate the public, policymakers, industry, and stakeholders on CCUS and uh, clean coal technologies by hosting webinars such as these, along with a series of monthly educational briefings, conference workshops. We have technical reports that we and we release monthly news clips of CCUS and clean coal related updates. Uh, if you'd like to join our our join our mailing list if you have not done so already. Uh, feel free to send an email to the address at the bottom of your screen. And we will add you as a subscriber to the consensus mailing list. Um, at the end of these sessions, we will uh, have a Q and A portion. Please use the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen to submit a question, and we will address as many as we can. And thank you all for joining. And I would like to introduce Mr. Derek Washman. Thank you, Michelle and Yate. Hey, everybody, uh, I'm I'm Derek Watchman. I am president of Sagebrush Hill Group LLC. Uh, my my company is a Navajo-owned company here on the Navajo Reservation, and we we provide professional services on many fronts, including including energy, tribal energy. And so, uh, with me, I have Steve Gray, and Steve and I are partnering on this project. And uh, we, we certainly appreciate USEA and, and them working with us, and of course, the Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy, FE. And so today we have a, a great agenda, and we'll get into it in a minute here, but I'll turn over to, to Steve to have him introduce himself. So, Steve. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Watchman, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Steve Gray. I am the board chairman for FORSED. And um, FORSED is, is an acronym for Four Corners Economic Development. And um, what, what we're here about is economic development. So I just wanted to um, let you know that's what uh, Four Corners Economic Development is about. I've had... Uh, Almost 30 years with uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So that's where I'm coming from. Okay, thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. And so, and so, why, why are we here? Um, I, I guess a little bit of history. Uh, a few years ago, uh, in, in in some discussion about tribes and carbon-based. And their their carbon based inventory and assets, uh, a lot of tribes basically gathered and said, you know, uh, many of us e even today are heavily dependent on fossil energy, carbon based fuels, and so you know, all the tribes recognize that that there's a new agenda. Well, it's not new, but uh, renewable carbon reduction is is the way of the future. It's coming upon us right now. And so the, the challenge that we that we recognize that I see with my company is how do we transition those tribes that have a, a lot of a lot of benefits from oil, coal, natural gas? How do we move them into or what, what should be considerations of, of moving these carbon based tribes into what is called the renewable energy, clean energy industry? And so a couple of years ago through through. FE and USEA, we decided to put together what is called the Indian Energy Minerals Forum. And so what we want today to talk about basically is, you know, what is the state of affairs for many of the tribes here in this country that utilize and have benefits from, again, coal, oil, gas, and, and, uh, and other carbon-based 
um, assets. And so many of these tribes have, have, have benefits of from royalties and it, it basically provides jobs and provides revenue to run their tribal governments. And so uh, we've been asked to host six webinars and today is our first webinar. And so we'd like to introduce and welcome First, Michael Moore. Michael Moore is the program director with the United States Energy Association. Uh, next is, uh, excuse me, CJ Stewart. And CJ is the energy director for the Crow Tribe. He was recently appointed and, and CJ has, has a long history. And he's, he's actually on the uh, DOE's Department of Energy's National Coal Council. And then hopefully soon, Margot Gray will be joining us. I don't see her. I, I think we have some technicalities here, but Margot Gray, a good friend of mine, she is actually a member of the Osage Nation Minerals Council and a huge background in, in energy, economic development, and, and we're, we're pleased to, to have her. And so, but today we really wanted to, to focus and have a discussion on where are we at? What is the state of affairs? Uh, with our, our, I'll say our tribes who have a lot of dependency on fossil energy. And so if you look at the statistics, uh, any country today possesses and holds a fair amount of, of assets, including oil, gas, and coal. And it's, it, it's up in almost, I believe, 10% of the, the asset base here in this country. And so quite remarkable. And so Indian country does obviously have a seat at the table. And so we'd like to hear, you know, from our speakers. And so, so without further ado, I would like to ask Michael Moore, who again is program manager for USEA to, to give us his perspective uh, because he's been involved on, on many fronts on, from tribal energy and, and on, the, on the commercial side. So uh, Michael, welcome. We appreciate you joining us. And uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on Again, you know, what is the state of affairs for carbon-based tribes here in the United States? So, Michael, floor is yours. Great, thank you, Derek. Thank you very much for having me involved, and appreciate that. And, and also appreciate the, uh, where I'm with with USEA to be part of them. And we also do also appreciate the Department of Energy's uh, support for these kind of programs. Um, where are we? How do we see these things? I've been around the energy sector for. Oh, got into it back in the early 80s and um, watched a lot of administrations come and go, watched a lot of energy events come and go, watched peak oil come and go. Now we're talking peak demand. And um, one thing I always tell people is don't discount human ingenuity when there's an opportunity that somebody else walks away from. Um, and one problem uh, with on the tribal side is there's been a lot of opportunity and not enough people have walked up to go take and work with it. Uh, there's a lot of identified resources in a, in a number of geographic areas with a, a fair number of tribes that have valuable resources. And then and over historical time, those resources have been tapped into when there's been a national need, uh, World War II with uranium and, and, and Cold War era, which there's, there's legacies to that. We're probably not here to talk about that part of it, but there is, there has been times when the resources have been utilized. Um, but today, in today's world, we have a lot of moving pieces that I think some some people haven't taken the opportunity to quite line up and look at the value proposition for the resources on some of the tribal lands. Oil, gas, and coal are changing the demographics, the use patterns where it's being applied, well, who's consuming, what the expectations are, are all changing. But none of the nothing has gone to zero demand for any of these commodities. They still have a value. There's still a there's still a, a very massive infrastructure and supply chain out there to move and distribute fossil fuels uh, to to marketplaces currently and part in the future. What do we do? What like any other area, it, there's efforts to decarbonize what these fossil fuels uh, will be able to do in a future low neutral, low carbon, no carbon kind of environment. Uh, again, don't discount human ingenuity to find ways to do things. We, we assess based on current technologies. Um, if, we, if we shied away from things in the beginning that were too expensive, that might be messing with direct air capture. Very, very, uh, very expensive proposition in the beginning, but there's a lot of work reducing that cost 
and it's coming down fairly quickly. Um, it, it, and same could happen for decarbonizing fossil fuels, for example, on tribal lands. To tell uh, the people that have these resources to plug them up, pack them up and put them away and, and thank you for participating and walking on would be wrong. There's a, there's a lot of value here. There's a lot of opportunity that creates wealth for, for the people of these different nations. And uh, should be more work done to help them have an equal play in this space as we do this transition out. It's an all of, above op it's an all of the above opportunity. Uh, Navajo gonna be a lot better suited for solar than say a crow are up in Montana, just because of the nature of where you're physically located at. But the opportunities uh, should be about the same. I think that there's a lot of opportunities for U.S. firms to take a closer look at their relationships with the uh, with the native tribes, with the with the communities that are there. That they're that are they are, they themselves, the energy companies themselves, are going through these transitions on how they can monetize their own resources and stay relevant and current in the marketplace. Why don't we take some of that knowledge and some of that experience and help uh, the native communities that have these same resources and help them monetize and stay relevant and pertinent in, the, uh, in today's marketplace. The world's not getting smaller, energy demand's not dropping, and the, the disconnects on global policies and politics today seem pretty, pretty active, but they've always been like that. So uh, materials that are close to home, uh, supply chains that take care of local and domestic uh, opportunities are gonna be more valuable as they have been. And uh, again, I think that there's, there's, there's been a, a disproportionate amount of, of activity on non-tribal lands to what could have been done to help monetize this resource space as well as do the transition. So I, I, I think, Derek, I kind of try to touch that on a high level. There has been a lot of work over the last 10 years, going through several administrations, trying to change some of the structural process of allowing some of the nations to have more say in the in the in the transactions and the management and the development of their resources. But I gotta tell you, uh, sitting outside the reservation, there's about four or five steps I don't have to go through. But if I'm doing any kind of energy work on so inside the reservation, I'd have to go through. And I can tell you from a personal experience, sitting through a a an agency's contracting process that was supposed to be a 20 page one hour webinar was it was a five hour webinar as they described all the required steps to properly document and fulfill the requirements of this contract to get funding to help support uh, with federal funds uh, projects that somebody was looking at on one of the reservations. And I said, good God, for five, five hours for a 20 page document, nobody on the other side of the table is gonna mess with that stuff. And and they they've got more resources to 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 put at it. Put yourself in the in the in the in the shoes of members of the tribe. You give them a contract that takes five hours and a lot of a lot of legal work and people jump around and and time spent. It's 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 a, it's challenging just in its own right. And I I think I've kind of caught the flavor. You know we have the as a as a tribal nation and I got a lot of respect for the work that you've done, Derek, with the with the Navajo, with the Casino Commission, how that what that would what that would have taken to bring that up from an idea to an actual industry, and and sit through all the required steps that you had to do to get that done, get licensed, get built, get organized, and create a uh, a, a, a resource space for the Navajo Nation. It was no small task. Uh, fossil fuels are going to be. Uh, Probably, I don't know if it would be more daunting than doing the casinos or not, but I'm sure that it's, it's a kind of dedication efforts required there too. And I, and I, and I, if you think some other areas I should touch base on, please let me know because I look forward to this yeah. engagement. Well, thank you, thank you, Michael. Maybe, maybe a quick question. You know, being being on the outside and 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 having. Kind of a national perspective uh, from the USEA and in your work on on the commercial side, uh, you mentioned some challenges. It, it takes maybe a few extra steps to get tribal energy done. But uh, what, what do you see are, are opportunities for tribes that perhaps are heavily focused on fossil energy? I know that USEA has 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 a lot of programs on carbon capture. You know. Uh, 
carbon sequestration and those kind of programs. What do you see from USEA's perspective as opportunities for those tribes that, that perhaps have fossil energy that could be used, if you will, for the new agenda that we're working on? They have the same issues actually as all of our US oil and gas producers have. They've got, they've got the pressures to decarbonize. They've got institutional investors that are asking them to take steps that they hadn't been asked to take before. They're, be, they're restructuring to transition into this new world where they still monetize their oil and gas resources. And that, that goes back to saying that these firms that are going through these transitions right now that are investing in these, in, in, for example, these captured technologies. We're reading about new partnerships almost daily now, that that, that relationship that the outside firms should find partners with their tribal relationships to bring these same experiences and uh, opportunities to them as well. And it satisfies a couple of uh, other parts of this energy transition that we're, we're going to go through. There's a certain social and environmental aspect of this that's really never been addressed to the extent that is being addressed today. So, so the opportunities actually should not be any different than the, what the firms outside the reservation have. What's what is what is different is the opportunities that are there. There's an opportunity. Oil and gas firms that are in this space have a great opportunity to help the tribal nations take these same resources to the same markets with the same kind of technologies and uh, and efforts as as in being supportive to get them there. All the markets are there. Everybody's scrambling for them. Outside the reservation, it's a dog eat dog. You know, people kill what they eat out here. It's not it's not a it's not there's no guaranteed one shoe fits all. You know, you read about companies that are coming and going all the time, but they the management took too much risk or not enough risk. It got overrun by the competitors. Or somebody somebody changed rules on them and they weren't looking. So for 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 the tribes with fossil fuel resources, um, more so than ever before, find a partner with one of these major oil and gas companies and get them to help provide some guideposts because they're learning right now too. This is all new for them, uh, and so that would be a suggestion. Now I, you know. A suggestion and taking something from an idea to practice always involves a lot of other steps. But I, I still drive a car. Of course, I'm not going to drive one for another 50 years. I'll be gone. But my, my, I suspect that there's going to be a lot of ice internal combustion engine cars around for years to come. They make them better. They last longer, and people hang on to them a lot longer. We've only got a, I don't I don't know what the number is. The United States 250 million automobiles and light duty trucks and and I don't know what I think one percent of that might be EV. So it's gonna ice is around for a while. And so those do your markets are there. Great, great. Well certainly uh, tribes have, have have a lot to offer in terms of national security and assets. And so like the question is how do you monetize what you have right now while at the same time transitioning into you know, a, a new energy energy um, environment, and so that's that's always a big challenge. And so, uh, Steve, you have any you have any questions for for Michael before we move on to CJ? Uh, no, I don't. You know, right off the top of my head, I think Mike hit it right on it. You know, it is a it is a transition that we are going to be moving to. You know, and so there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity that we have to take advantage of at this point. Correct. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you, Michael. Let, let's move on to uh, CJ Stewart. And again, CJ, welcome. Appreciate you joining us. And CJ is is the new energy director for the Crow Tribe. And I know that the Crow Tribe has has a significant amount of, of fossil assets that they've been, you know, using to to fund their tribal government. And so, uh, so CJ, welcome again. Congratulations on your new posts, and uh, we're we're glad to have you here. Uh, can you share with us, you know, what 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 the situation is, and you know how uh, your your new chair, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and and what you are working on to to move your tribe into a, a better energy future? 
So the floor is yours, CJ, and welcome again. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, before I even get, get going on that, I want to make recognition to, uh, you know, you know, the, you, you say this is your first webinar, and you know we're holding it on on the National Awareness Day for MMIW, as you. Uh, that's why I'm wearing my red. So. Wow, that's good. Yes. Uh, today is the National Day um, Awareness for MMIW, and there's a lot of folks out there that are that are are still dealing with this. You know, not only the pandemic, but you know, just dealing with. The overall, um, you know, drug and sex trafficking that's going on in any country. Now, I'll, I'll get back to that part of it, you know, because a lot of this is, it, it has, it has something and everything to do with our our the development of our natural resources. You know, first of all, you know, the Crow tribe, you know, being the largest private co-owner in the nation, and, you know controlling 10% of the nation's um, coal re reserves, as well as 3% of the world's, you know, we, you know, we don't, we're only averaging about 6.5 million tons a, a year, you know, through, um, you know, just, just the process of, of getting development going through um, for Indian country. And, that, and, and now we're, we're down to a million tons and, it, it's, you know, when you're ask, asking this, you know, state of affairs of, of not only the tribes, but my tribe, it, it's not looking very well, you know, you know, first of all, you know, we're doing everything that, you know, back Indian, when Indian policy was established, you know, they wanted, they wanted Native Americans to work their own land. They wanted Native Americans to produce their own land. And, and, you know, that was Indian policy. And then they moved on to establishing um, the passive royalty agreements where, you know, where either yourself or you can get someone else to work, work your, work your ground, develop your resources, you know, your agriculture, whatever. And they put us in the position where we sit back and, and take a royalty check or a lease check. And, you know, we're, we we have grown as a society in 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 America as Native Americans we have we have some very um, you know powerful attorneys we have we have doctors in all fields not just the medical field we have we have um, individuals that have that hold MBAs and you know. Right now we're sitting on a on a webinar with USCA hosted by a Native American company. Native Americans are are we're we're moving forward in in all areas, and yet, um, as I stated before, being the largest private co owner in the nation, you know, it really doesn't matter if it's under a Republican president administration or a Democratic administration. We've always been stuck at 6.5 million tons. We're, we're never um, really able to move forward in in that regard to to increase our our tonnage. In our in our heyday, we made about 7.3 million tons in one in one year back in 2007. And our neighbors to the south were were make, were producing well over 200 million tons a year. Now. I, I kind of look at that, that that there's something wrong with that picture. Not only is is it is is it a situation of today where, you know, we have an administration that is very, um, you know, aggressive towards towards the the fossil fuel industry, and I get that. You know, I get that. Um, you know, I like clean air, I like clean water, and you know, we fight for it. We fight for it every day and here on the reservation you know you've got you've got folks out there fighting these fights and and then they and then it come boils down to um you know you know it boils down to you know like right now you look at you look at crow 
you know, back in 1825, we created a friendship treaty with the United States government. We've never made war with them. And yet, because we own coal, it feels like there's a war against us right now by the very people we made friends with back in 1825. In 1825, that document stated that we would protect the United States government with our warriors, with our young brave men to, uh, to protect their trade routes. And then they would do the same with us as we traded with, with um, the different fur traders and the different folks that are trading at that time. And so we agreed that they would be able to access through our, our um, ancestral homelands in, in, the name, in the name of commerce and trade. And we protected them. The United States asked us for that protection and access. We obliged them back in 1825. And in that, we stated that we would support the United States. We would always be there for them. We still have our, our, young, our young women and our young men serving in the military to this day. And, you know, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to say that that we, we stuck by our word ever since 1825. Although it seems like the US government has dodged that every, every chance they got. But we would always have to remind them of, of that day when we made friends and that we were gonna protect each other's commerce and protect each other's trade routes. Here we are today. What, what do I say about this the state of affairs that we're in? You know, we're, we're down to a million tons and they're telling us, go to renewables, go to renewables. But, and yeah, that, yeah, there, there's a bunch of money that's, that's, that's out there for renewables, but the application process and just the, the process in general to access that 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 money for for the for the renewable side is is very intensive and it, you know it's asking you know almost you know almost you know as, as we're looking at things like that and trying to move forward and trying to almost do a, about face from from what we're doing with coal to go and try to do something else with with um whether it be solar, wind, or geothermal, I'm not against any of that. I'm not against any of that. But when it comes to Indian nations, you know, we're we're trying to, you know, bring money in to support not only jobs and revenue, but the revenue that comes in. We we use that as matching grants to get federal monies, to get federal grants to subsidize our social programs, you know, our alcohol and drug programs, our youth our elder programs, you know, feeding our elders, making sure that they have lunch, making sure that they have a good dinner. And we have people out there serving these, these, um, these um, individuals, these, these elders and uh, of our tribe. If we don't have this money, we can't get those matching grants to do any of that. What, what's the United States government gonna do then? We have agreements, like I said, the treaties, and, you know, as we move forward, we, we, we count on those agreements. We count on that, that relationship that we had established with the United States government. And, and so as, as, we're move, as we, we move forward, we have to be reminded, are we not an Article I entity of the United States government? Were we not named in the United States government in Article 1 in the United States Constitution? It states in there that Indian tribes operate under Indian Commerce Clause. The only ones that can regulate commerce with Indian tribes is Congress. Therefore, you have the 1825 Treaty, the 1851, the 1868, the 1920 Crow Act. And as we move forward, 
I have to be reminded and look at these laws that the United States government has agreed to uphold. And yet in their in their um in in their in their you know their their fast moving um agenda they forget about some of these things. Indian country, when you look at Indian country, all 576 federally recognized sovereign nations don't have, not everybody has land. Not all those tribes have mineral. Not all those tribes have land and mineral. But we don't hold that against them. We, we, they, they're doing their best and we support them about doing their best, whether it be the Northwest tribes and their fishing, their fisheries and the things that they're doing with their casinos as well as the East Coast and their casinos, we support that. We support them because that's bringing um, revenue and jobs to their people, much needed revenue, much needed jobs, especially at a time like this during the pandemic. Not, our, not only are we already down and out, but the United States government comes in and this administration chooses to kick us while we're down. It hurts, it hurts. And as I'm, as I'm thinking about these agreements that we have made, I have to continue to think back at these agreements, hoping that maybe we will have a platform to speak because 60% of the nation's resources is undeveloped. And guess where those resources are? Indian country. The United States government is operating on the first 40% of the resources that they already have all the way back to when Rockefeller discovered oil in Pennsylvania and, and you know, everybody else started moving forward in industrial age. Seemed like a big, big time in a, in, a, in a good time back then in that era, but at the same time, they were just now tapping into the resources that the United States has. Indian country controls 60% of those resources. They lie in Indian lands and we were never asked, we were never given the courtesy to sit at the table. When they talk about coal and they're making decisions about coal, why am I not asked to be there? I'm the only Native American serving on National Coal Council. And I'm the energy director for the Crow Tribe, the largest private coal owner in the nation. Why isn't the chairman asked to be a part of this? You know, our chairman is working hard and diligently right now to do a lot of, to, to, to kind of, um, you know, solve a lot of the, the problems that we have at the same time, correct a lot of, um, you know, things that have, have occurred. And he's doing a good job um, right now. I, unfortunately, he's, you know, he, he's doing, you know, he, he's wearing the hat of a dad today. You know, he's taking care of his son you know, in, in uh, his appointments in Seattle. And so, you know, it, it's, it's fine. You know, I'm, I'm able to speak to this issue and my, I have a passion for it. You know, when I look at, when I look at Indian country, when I look at the Osage or when I look at the Southern Ute, you know, I look at Navajo, when I look at all these different tribes that hold resources, Hickory and their oil and gas, Wind River and their oil and gas, you know, you, you, as you, as we're looking in the Northern Utes and, you know, why aren't we brought to the table? Why are we not, why aren't, why are we not allowed to, to be able to speak to these issues? Whereas someone up there in a suit that probably never even came to Crow is speaking on behalf of coal and not doing a good job, you know, and they're, they're wanting to kill coal and i get that like i said earlier you know you got corporations you know you know corporate greed and but don't don't wrap us up in all of that don't let us pay for the sins of those corporations that have caused a lot of problems the first americans like i said control all this resources the native americans control all these resources. Not every tribe has land and, and mineral. And that's where we have a problem is where the folks on the Hill in, in Washington, DC, they listen to folks from uh, the National Congress of American Indians and 
And even at that, those folks from the National Congress of American Indians haven't ever reached out to Crow. I don't know if they've reached out to other any other tribes to to make sure that they're um it's it's you know it's something that that they agreed to when they speak on their behalf. So with you know, with that being said, I you know it's it it's it's just it's just kind of frustrating to sit here and have have that understanding that the very people that say that they have trust responsibility over you to see that you benefit and to see that you move forward to help you with technical assistance to move you forward and assist you in developing your resources are the very people that are discriminating against you and they're they're making indian country pay for the sins of the corporation and the, all the corporate greed and it 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 just it's just it's it's tough it's it's tough to to not speak out freely on this and not try to you know it, it's upsetting I, I i've reached out to the intergovernmental affairs in in the white house i haven't get a, got a response i did finally did speak with um director johns we had a very good talk and at the indian energy uh, office by zoom of course <coughs> And you know, of course, they're 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 hired, and so they have to abide by an agenda. And the Crow tribe, being a treaty tribe, on a government to government basis, I I would like and I would want President Biden to sit down with Crow and talk about this. Vice, Vice um, President Kamala Harris to sit down with Crow and talk about this. Maybe they'll get a a, a better uh, perspective of the of the people that they're killing. Maybe they'll think differently. I don't know. I can only hope for the best. So that that that's what I'm looking at right now, and those are the problems that I, that we're facing. Um, I have more to add, Derek. You know, I know you're doing a good job and I appreciate, you know, creating this platform because we didn't have one. We didn't have a platform to speak, the, the fossil fuel tribes. And Department of Interior, you know, being the ones that are supposed to oversee all land and mineral, we have not heard from them. And I'm waiting patiently, you know, I'm anticipating that I'll hear from them. But if I don't, I know why. I've reached out many times to 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 participate in any discussions that that have any um you know relevant you know you know agendas, you know, whatever whatever's going on, I want to be a part of that. But at the same time, you know, we gotta kind of be in the know. And we're not, and and it's just it's it, it it's hard to say that you know when I when I bring this out you know it, some people they they don't they don't believe me but you know Indian country controls sixty percent of the nation's resources and we're not at the table they choose to keep us on the menu we need to be at the table we have these resources we need to participate in the in the in, in whatever needs to be done. Back in 2007, we had the Many Stars deal, and that was dealing with bio, biomass coda liquids development through liquefaction. That liquefaction technology was gonna capture 98.6% of the carbon. We were the first in Indian country to be able to eliminate carbon footprint on a project that going into the Obama administration, and it got shelved and eventually died. It wasn't that it wasn't ready. All the I's were dotted, T's were crossed. They just didn't help us. So we lost out on that opportunity. And it seems like we're going back into a reflection of, of what had happened then versus now. But now they're not gonna be satisfied until Crow has no resource to develop. And so what do we do? It's a taking. You know, 
they, they've taken they've taken so much from us and now they've taken my ability to develop my resource. Why not work with the Indian tribes? Why not work with the 60% that control the, the the fossil fuel interests of the nation and, and, and allow them to be the first to develop instead of these corporations that are developed overseas, come in here and serve as US citizens when I have every right to develop my resources as a first, first nation citizen of this United States. I can count my generations back further than seven. I have every right to speak and I have every right to be worried about where this is gonna go for my people because we have no, you know, what do we do? You want us to do solar, you want us to do wind, but at the same time, you know, I judge them by their parking lots. You go to a coal mine, you got 50 cars sitting there, you know, every every shift at least or better. You go to a refinery, you got 50, 100 cars there on every shift or better. Tell me how many cars you see in the solar field in their parking lot. And tell me how many cars you see in the wind, wind farm in their parking lot. How is that gonna help my people? I like to try to assist in the agenda that has in front of us from this administration. But at the same time, I want some cooperation too. If I cooperate, then you cooperate. That's my message to Uncle Sam. We already made agreements back in 1825 that we were gonna protect each other's commerce and trade. We made friends back then. We shook hands and we pledged our warriors, whether they died for this cause or they didn't, they made that commitment. And to, the, to this day, we are still bound to that commitment we still have our young folks in the military overseas. And we are still standing up for the United States government. All I ask is, can they stand up for us? So I'll, I'll reserve any, you know, questions or any more comments for, you know, later on in the webinar, if you, if you, if that, if that helps, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Very compelling words, and yes, you know I, I do appreciate and and feel for for what you're saying. Certainly, a, a long history and long legacy of uh, the relationship between the United States and Indian tribes. My my tribe Navajo also has a treaty, Treaty of 1868, and so you know all all those Indian people obviously are looking to uh, adhering to those treaties, honoring trust responsibilities working hand in hand. And so uh, I don't I don't know, Steve, do you have any questions right now before we move on? Let's or Michael, any questions for CJ before we take uh, introduce Margo just real quickly? Oh, no, I don't. Okay. Michael? Um, yeah, you know what, CJ, I'm just sitting here sitting at a guy on the outside and thinking out loud. But you have these resources, they have a known value. Um, there's a process to turn them into valuable uh, commodities to get them out of the ground, get them out to the market. But in my world, I can go with proven producible reserves and go to the market and uh, raise equity or debt against certified proven producible reserves. And the banking industry recognizes that process and the Wall Street folks recognize that process. There's a set of term, you know, a set of protocols that to define what proven producible reserves might be, uh, oil, gas, and coal. And um, why doesn't uh, maybe Department of Interior as your trustee become the third party that can verify the veracity of your resources that are producible and their reserve size and their value and go to Treasury and say, hey, we've got as trustees, the control and the management uh, these very well-known sizable resources with a very valuable proposition to them. Uh, the, the, the crow are encumbered in trying to get these out to the market, 
but they could get out there in certain situations. Why not have Treasury pre-advance the value of these resources that are known to be there? Maybe, maybe Treasury is inclined to have them mined to collect the money back, or maybe Treasury could be inclined to claim a carbon value that they remove from the marketplace without removing the value proposition to the crow. It, there's a lot of moving pieces in there, and I and I and I and I am not as naive to, to DC as it may have just sounded. Uh, it's not a simple process to do what we just what I just brought up. But I don't know that it's actually ever been seriously pursued. But why shouldn't it be? There could be a way to be partnering, uh, supporting, providing this assistance and uh, the help and the financial wherewithal and also be in line with the transitioning piece by then leaving the, the resources in the hands of the Treasury and your trustee to decide whether they actually want to take it to the market or not or claim it as a carbon reduction by leaving it in the ground, but you get but you get paid. And in, in Europe today, carbon credits are about $56 a ton. For, for folks that are trading in the carbon market in Europe, I think it's 50 euros a ton right now today. So you got a starting point, might be worth more for carbon than it is as the commodity coal. And with that one, it's more of an observation than a question, I, and I see Margo, it looks like you're there. I'm going to get off and, and let Derek have his uh, floor back. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank good you. comments. And again, you know, and, and, and you know what we're trying to do with with this forum and this webinar is to is to generate conversation. You know, what are the possibilities? And, and certainly, a long legacy between you know the federal government and tribes. Uh, a, a, a lot of relationship worship. A lot of tribes actually got formed because, as, as CJ pointed out, corporations needed access to the oil, coal, and gas. And so through the United States government, uh, governments were created. I know, for example, the Navajo Nation and the council was actually created so that they could approve oil and gas leases that were needed so that, you know, you know corporate America could start uh, manufacturing and producing oil and gas activities here on, on the Navajo Reservation, and so and many other tribes were in that situation, and so uh, a long a long history. So what we want to do in the next five is is talk about on, uh, uh, on an isolated basis, you know, capital access, what are opportunities, what the, what technologies are out there, and so. But the, the the big challenge right now today is that because of because of history, many Indian country tribes are heavily dependent on fossil fuels. And so, yes, there's a new agenda. So how do we con converse and how do we get tribes to the big agenda? While at the same time, pres preserving revenue. And, and, and I like what you said, CJ, cars in the parking lot. That is a, a, a very interesting point, in my opinion. That's a good way to judge job creation. And so we have to keep that in mind. And so, so there wasn't an exit question for CJ. I, I think Mar Margo, I don't know if you're on. I think there's been some technical challenges here. Margo, are you are you on? She's not. Okay. Well, um, I, I, I we may we may be close to the end here, but um, um, I, I guess let, let me let me add to you know the whole purpose for again the Indian Energy Minerals Forum. You know, yes, we have as I said earlier a national agenda for carbon reduction, clean energy, and so. But this is in the midst of again carbon uh, carbon resource tribes and their dependency, and so we really want to outline it and have a conversation on energy self determination. Uh, how do we improve and address our environmental best practices? You know, one of the big obstacles in moving into actually, there's the big obstacle for creating major tribal energy projects or moving into, you know, renewable projects is basically access to capital. That's been the you know one of the biggest biggest challenges that many many tribes face. And then also, how do you form relationships? You know, with corporate America, as as we talked about here, a lot of times, in in my experience, may, many companies have hesitation dealing with tribes. You know, probably because of of the trust land, 
you know, maybe the legal system. And so we want to talk about that. Uh, but what we'd like to do basically is, is figure out how do we position and talk handily about, about assisting and, and, and advancing tribes so that they, they can be a part of the new agenda. While at the same time transitioning from coal, oil and gas to, you know, what we see today, and that's carbon reduction. Margo, are you, are you there? I yeah, I'm you. here. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can see you. Can you see me? No. I don't know what's going on. Don't know. So, okay. Uh, but I'm here. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Well, um, I, I think there's a button there that says thought video and, and our, our apologies, everybody, you know, we had a zoom problem, so we had to move over to WebEx. And so I know many of us had to resign. And so, uh, so thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead, Margo, and welcome again. Thank you for, for joining us. And I know you're very busy and, you know, time, time is critical for you. But as I said earlier, uh, Margo is a member of the Osage Minerals Council and has a long, long, uh, tremendous history as a as a native businesswoman and as has been has participated on many fronts. And so, uh, Margo, if you could, we'd like to hear your perspective on again the state of affairs for your tribe, Osage Nation. You know, as as you continue to to consider how to utilize your resources while taking into consideration the, the agenda, you know, that, that our new president administration um, is advancing. So, Margo, welcome, and I'll turn it over yeah. to you. Yes, thank you, Derek, and um, thank you for inviting me. And sometimes Zoom meetings go good or WebEx meetings, and so this is just, uh, this is what, um, here we are with technology. <laughs> but, um, you know, ever since the, um, uh, and we had a conversation about this yesterday. It doesn't matter who's in office, Indian country still has to work. We go to work every day. It doesn't matter who's in the administration, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter because we continue to work for our people. But what we do have to do is we have to change and be um, always flexible with, okay, what is this administration's agenda? Um, with this one, um, I would say, just, I'm just going to be frank. There's no way, I, you, know, you know me, Derek, if I mm -hmm. was able to be an eloquent speaker, that's Ron Solomon. That's not what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to get is, um, hey, here's the problem. You know, we have a continual work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, I, and I'll just get to a problem that's just predominant here at Osage is that, we we work with DEMD. They've been fantastic to work with. You've got them over here who is trying to do everything to help with business development. You have them help us do um, where we may not have all the resources to have analysis done or access to uh, grants and and uh, but they're there to help us. They give that technical support. That's great. And the. One of the last things that was done before the administration changed is here's the Bureau of Indian Affairs and then they stuck DEMD right under it. You put a regulatory body underneath a business development body. They need to sit side by side. You know as well as being um, a former um, CEO of, of Navajo Gaming, you had your business development arm and then you had your regulatory arm. They have to work together to check some balance. The same thing here, but when you put one over the other, it's it's like a it's a, a a mixture for failure. So that is that's one thing that we see here because sometimes the bureau will say no, now you can't talk to the EMD when it used to be just hey pick up the phone. Um, so it slows progress down, and then with with the Department of the Interior, um, where they are. And, we had this conversation yesterday with, with CJ and I were just going back and forth of here are the issues. The issue is this on the table is we have, you know, fish and wildlife. We have all the regulatory, um, you know, just bombarded by you can't do this. You can't do that. But yet 
we want to be, we have people in my, I, I'm just going to speak about my community because that's the only thing I can do. I have relatives. There's people every day. I mean, they're walking around outside. They're like, we need jobs. This industry has, it's, it's caved over here. And so we've had all of big business, all big oil and gas has moved on. Why? Because it takes 270 days to get a permit. They go one county over and they can get a permit within um, seven to 12 days and, and be up and going. 270, they go, well, we've got it reduced down to 200. Oh, hallelujah. You know, but I'm sorry, but people need to make payroll within 30 days, not 270 days. You know, so when you start removing the barriers and all of the issues, and so, and we continue to have these conversations with the Bureau, but though it's, it's they listen, but they don't act. And so finally I go, what, at what point does something happen? So um, right now I've, I'm looking forward to, to speaking with, um, you know, the new uh, Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland. I think that she totally understands when she was in Congress, I had talked to her, here are our issues. Here are, here's Osage issues. We've got, now I'm, I'm all about protecting what needs to be protected and I'm all about clean water. That's not the issue. The issue is we've already proven that there's, you know, we, we did it with the ABB, the American Burn and Beetle. They're all over the place. But if it's a rancher, they get a categorical exclusion for their wild horse program under, um, you know, branch land management. But, but when we want 1.2 acres, they're going, nope, can't have that. Nope, got to, you know, we have to do all these other surveys and stuff. It is just, it's issue after issue after issue, and we're trying to remove those issues. And when you're an elected official, four years is tough to get something done. And then we're in the middle of two administrations. So if this new administration, when uh, we were talking about, you know, 60% of all the um, energy being energy resources being on on Indian lands. You just think of Crow, Navajo, and Osage right there. Our land base, I mean, we're like one point, about more, almost 1.5. Crow is at over, what, 2.5? I'm just throwing the numbers out there, but then Navajo is huge. And um, we always got to go run up there and tell them we're here. But instead of, they should already know, they already should know that. Instead of looking at uh, the oil markets in the Middle East or for any carbon, we have it here. It's right here. And what it does is it impacts the economic development of any native community. We have so many people that right now we've, we've got a, we got a small amount of money to do some well plugging. We've had a hundred years of of wells that need to be plugged, emergency wells, over 1,600 of them that haven't been. We've got old pipe in the ground. There's no historical documents that say, this is what we are, what we have. And then, of course, then the Bureau throws in the Freedom of Information Act. Now we can't list it. We can't give you anything. We can't have anybody come prospect here. It's like they just have put their hands around our neck and just are squeezing. And, you know, we're going to die on the vine here if, if something drastically does not happen. Um, you know, um, Osage is no, we're not new to this industry. We've been doing this ever since J. Paul Getty got off a train about a mile from my office. And every other, Frank Phillips, every big oil company that was here, because this was the biggest thing in Indian country or the United States in the world. The Osages were, um, became extremely wealthy over that, but with wealth came a lot of pain as well. We learned, you all, the other tribes learned the, the price that we paid and we paid with, we paid with our lives for, for how we were treated under the Allotment Act and how we were treated under the, the head right system. It set, it set us up for so many different problems. But here's the difference now, Derek, is that we're educated and we speak English and we understand this industry. 
backwards and forwards. So if this administration wants to engage on, we, are, we will be flexible at looking at, okay, oil and gas is not gonna go away. That need is here. Is, is it a high need? No, and I'm not gonna say no, but it's it's not on their, their radar, but it's on our radar as being a high need. But if they want us to be flexible and look at like, um, can we produce hydrocarbons? Well, I've got a study going on right now to make sure that we'll be able to do that. We have oil, gas, and water that border completely around here. Um, so we want to be flexible with the new administration. Hey, we can do this, but engage us. That's the issue. You know, um, there, I, I get it that the new uh, person in the seat over at Energy is a member of your tribe, but it's green, green, green. But, you know, that you have to show that you are still engaging into the oil and gas industry. We got oil, oil and gas tribe. And so, and you know, that that's kind of a, what, and that's as one of seven on our council, that's how I feel about it. That's just me. But I know that my colleagues, we all continue to work every day because we wanna put these people back to work. Because what happens when people don't work and people, and I'm just saying this is, it doesn't matter if this is in um, the Appalachian Mountains or whatever, when you, when they were working on coal or uh, and it, when you have communities that are already away from a, a city that drugs, violence, domestic abuse, um, uh, we have a meth problem here. Why they have nowhere to go and someone is looking to, you know, um, Crime rate increases. So it's like the economic balance is off. If they want to help curb that, change the balance of it, infuse money into the tribe that can do um, green energy. You know, that's what we should be looking at. Help us with that. Don't make it so hard. They'll say, oh, we've got 3 billion that access to capital. Yeah, but then when you start going after, it's like, oh my God, there's just no way. It's, 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 it's almost another arm wrestle over the, on the other side. So it has to be something. I mean, we've got projects that we would like to have funded right now. You know, we learned one thing for sure that we got to have above ground, below ground storage, more storage than what we need. Um, this this um, uh, United States got hit um, flat on their feet when all this happened what resources we have, what we didn't, what was gonna happen. And we, you know, we survived it. We got through that administration. We're going into another one. So um, our, my feeling is that engage, engage the tribes that are already into, that can do this. And I mean this as being um, flexible with doing green energy, um, hydrocarbon, but also don't forget this country still needs um, you know, look at what Texas went through when, uh, when that ice storm hit. Lives were lost. We don't want to see that. We, you know, we want to be a, a part of the solution, but it, but we need to be engaged. And we're we're trying to go up to D.C. now to go meet with them. So I, that's just what I'm. I mean, I'm not telling anything that isn't already out there. So. Great, thank you, Margo. Uh, in, any questions for her? Uh, Mike, CJ, Steve? I had something on um, real quick. <clears throat> I guess it's not really a question, it's just an agreement. I'm in agreement with what Margo's saying. I mean, just like I stated earlier, we went we went from, you know, you know, the middle of March, all of a sudden, boom, pandemic, everybody's shelter in place, mass, you know, they put the fear of God in everybody. And 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 then they turn around and they say, yeah, we're going to give you guys a bunch of money, you know, to help to do this and do that and do that. Yeah, okay. But then they turn around and say, you know, you know, under this CARES Act and ARPA and whatever. And then when we're, you know, coal and oil is part of the, you know, the critical essentials, um, you know, infrastructure lists, and yet we're not even, 
were not even recognized. You know, when when that list was established, you know, we were part of it. And 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 yet again, um, we have to jump through so many hoops just to just to get a meeting, you know, with someone that put their hand on their Bible and said that they're gonna take care of us. You know, I get it, you know, worrying worrying about, you know, the Middle East and everybody else, you know, and you know, and forgetting about the, the Native American communities. I mean, it's almost a norm for the non-members, you know, for the for, for the folks that aren't Native, you know. And you know, I, I I've seen I've seen this um positioning in the politically from this administration about how they're really going to help the Native American community. Prove it. You know, don't don't kick the, the, the folks that have 60% of this nation's resources to the curb. And then later on, when you need it, come over and, 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 and you know, swipe it away from us by eminent domain when we're in the middle of wanting to cooperate right now. And that's all I'm saying is that, you know, along with what Margot's saying, I mean, and along with what, you know, we've basically... They've put us all the way back to the 70s. I mean, Margo, when did you start your, your, you know, your oil operations? I mean, they took you to the beginning of that now. You know, back when we had to yeah. establish ourselves with the United States, you know, back when we had to establish our coal resources, we had to take um, the United States government in order for, for a company to come on board to, to be enticed to work with the tribe. They advised us to, to, to take a 6.5% royalty. No severance taxes or ad valorems, just the six and a half percent royalty. And that was just to prove up the resource that we knew we already had. And for a long time there, the United States government, after we already proved up the resources that we already have, they still wouldn't lift that six and a half percent. And just recently, you know, in in you know, at the beginning of the 2000s, we were able to um, establish a sliding scale for a 12.5% royalty on our coal, which bumped up our per capita to the to our um, to our overall membership. And and like I said before, you know, um, I don't know how many Osage there is. All I know is that there's only like little under 15,000 crows. And when you know, it made me laugh because I was. You know, I, I guess it was kind of upsetting at the same time, but you know how, how Indians are. We kind of laugh at things, you know, and to get through stuff. And I was pretty um, disturbed when when I was testifying before the, um, you know, EPW committee when Barrasso was chairing it. And we were talking about the clean water mm -hmm. uh, 401 um, issues, you know, on the, the port stuff. Well, all the Republicans are on one side and all the Democrats are on the other. And as I'm talking, you know, the Democrats are kind of slowly leaving. They're all taking off, you know, and nobody wants to listen. But one guy st st stuck around, you know, and um, not too sure, but what, I think it might have been uh, Mr. Booker, Senator Booker, asked a question about, you know, um, you know, endangered species in that area and how we were going to mitigate that i was like come on man how many endangered species over there you know one a million i don't know they're too small to even know but at the same time I'm, there's one sitting right in front of him and he didn't even see him there's only like fourteen thousand of us and what what's going to happen to us how many how many osages there and yeah, there is a lot of Navajos, but overall, when you look at the when you look at the big scenario of things, we are the Native American community. We are all endangered species right now, okay. and we we cannot we and, and we are getting we are putting there there there's you know blocking our our path to you know you know to success from you know from you know putting impediments in front of us from developing our own resources. And, and 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 then when we raise that money in our tribal coffers, we end up having to, um, you know, the federal government then again has us use our own money to, to um, you know, in, in 
you know, to match grants. Now that we don't have this money to match those grants that the U.S. government is requiring us to do because they required us to get away from the resource that they're today demonized, now grandma don't have food. Now we have no youth that are uh, can get scholarships now. Now we have no head start. Now we have, you know, I mean, just all the social pro programs. Our kids are in the system. We're trying to bring them home. We're trying to build a a, a place for them to, to be at and, and, and create an environment where they can live in, you know, whereas, you know, we have homeless, but it's not visible. We have three to four families living in one home. Just because they're not on the streets or on the, on the, on the stairs of the Capitol doesn't mean that they're not homeless. They're sitting there in homes, and then they tell us to shelter in place during this pandemic. Go for go go um go go you know go fourteen days in 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 quarantine. How do you do that in an Indian home? So coming out of this pandemic, first of all, we're getting bombarded with with um this agenda of of yeah clean energy. And like I said, Margot, I agree with you. I agree totally with you. I mean, I like clean air. I like clean wind and 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 rain and good rain water and i like i like to see the green grass i mean <clears throat> i'm on, on this reservation i i have a i have um you know in floor heating geothermal i'm the only green i have the only green home on the reservation in in on the crow reservation and i'm on the national coal council and right here i'm sitting in front of you talking about the impediments of indian country concerning our fossil fuels and this agenda that we're looking at what more am I doing? In 2007, we created we created a, a program that captured 98.6% of the carbon through liquefaction of our quota liquids, you know, project that we were going to do, the Many Stars program. What more? You know, we're sitting here, and and then they turn around and tell us, you know, go to wind, go to solar. Um, I'm all for it. I would like it. I would like to do that. I'd like to subsidize our homes, you know, electrical costs by solar and wind. You know, and then again, they say, oh, we got all this money. And then again, I, I get an email and then they turn around and say, oh, DOE gave out 19 million for this. And then this one gave out this much for this. And then here, I don't even get an email to even apply for this stuff. I mean, and I'm, I'm part of the, I'm part of their listserv. I mean, like you, Margo, I'm just like you. I, I, I want to go to D.C. And, and, and talk to some of these folks. But first of all, do they even, I mean, can they, I mean, I can pick up a phone call. They can pick up a phone, you know. I mean, it would be great to have some synergy by invite only, you know, or, or whatever be the case. If we want to get up there together as tribes and talk to these folks, you know, and, and, and let them know what's on our mind. Because clearly they do not want to. Be, you know, come out voluntarily and, and ask us these questions, you know, or even say, hey, what's up with you guys? Are you guys okay with this? I mean, uh, is there something we should change? Is there something we should add? How do you guys feel about this as being Native American? You know, I mean, the Biden administration, the, the Biden-Harris administration have really came out in their campaign saying that they were going to stick up for Indians. Stick up for us. If not, tell us why. Go on the record, you know, and that's that's just it, it hurts. It hurts to know that, you know, the very people that say they have trust over you are the very people that are breaching trust today by killing our nation's GDP. And I'm talking about the Crow Nation's GDP, coal. Yeah. <clears throat> and I get it, I get it, yeah. Everybody's transitioning away from this and transitioning away from that. But don't let us pay for those those corp that corporate greed and their sins. You know, there's a lot of folks making a lot of money out there, and nobody's saying nothing to them. But when it comes down to it, they want us to turn around and voluntarily give up our resources and pat us on the back with a data boy. No, you're going to pay for this. Is what I'm looking at. I mean, we got to turn around and we got to say, hey, how are we going to get into the solar? How are we going to get into the wind? Yeah, there's money there, but how are you going to assist us to expedite this? You want us to say no that fast? Well, why don't you bring some dollars that quick? You know, it's, that, that's just my, I, I'm in agreement with Margo. I, I apologize for taking time.
Yeah. No. There, Thank you. Go ahead, Margo. One more minute. Yeah, can I add on to that? At, at, the, at the end of the day, they are our trustee. And I'll say it over and over to them. Do you understand, especially with this administration and also with the other one, they, uh, we, did, we suffered the worst we have ever suffered. And, there, and I'm not just, I'm not picking on administrations, but we all did. I'm just telling you. I mean, that's not, that's a fact. When oil and gas went in one day dropped down to $37 below, that was devastating. We had nowhere to store. We had nowhere to, um, our, our people completely suffered. And so now, today, we are looking at, you know, $65 um, a barrel right now. So you think they would be engaging us, especially as we see incremental um, uh, rise to um, to uh, oil and gas production. But here, we, are, like I said, we are so strangled by the 200 to 270 days and they've got to wait. And, you know, business doesn't work like that. I'm, I swear, if they had to go out and work in, in business as we know it, whether it's a tribal enterprise or um, in corporate America, you know, they, they couldn't keep up with that pace. And I did want to hit on something really big is that Indian country doesn't have access to the most cutting edge technologies that is happening globally. That's what we need access to, not, not old technologies or, hey, this has been tried. We need, there are new ways to um, um, extract, look at different types of um, uh, ways that we can uh, utilize it and be a part of this solution as opposed to, to um, um, shoot, we're, st we're still chasing the tail here. That's, that's what's so, um, disheartening right. and um, I, I think I, what CJ said about you know we're worried about something that's being that we've already proven is not going to be extinct it did get downlisted from the ABB from um, uh, in, you know endangered to threatening we have two um, two uh, universities that have done a study and say they are no longer a threat lift this band and um, you know, no, we're at we're at risk. And in 2000, in 1906, there were 2,229 Osages. Today, we're over to uh, 20,000, about 21,000. It takes a long time to recover, but not everyone is a shareholder in this estate. We were set up in such a um, patrilineal type of, of uh, system that the only way that my children will, they have to, I have to die in order for them to inherit um, head rights of what I own, of what I, I receive. That system is archaic and it is, um, it's, it's like, you know, it, it's sad. And I think that's what is, um, and we, we still have to live under it. And it's, you know, uh, we don't have access to our, our own information. That's being held from us. Everything is being blocked from us producing. We know that we have, the DMD estimated we have seven, 700 billion barrels of oil still underneath the ground. And that doesn't seem to click to anybody. Are you kidding me? That's a lot of oil. Yep. So. Great. Well, we're, we're almost to the end here and, and great, great comments. Uh, great conversation. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Margo. And thank you, Mike. Uh, this, this webinar series, and we have five more, is, is primarily focused on, on generating conversation and, and the, the primary topic is basically tribes that are using and benefiting from fossil fuels. How do we look at it and what are the next steps and how do we consider again? And, and I, I'm, I'm basically talking as a Navajo, basically we're, we're also heavily dependent on carbon, carbon based fuels. How do we together work and, and, and move into again, 
a new environment where we're talking carbon reduction, clean air, clean energy. And so uh, our next our next webinar is in two weeks on May 19th. And so we'll certainly post our speakers, but I'd like to turn it over to Steve for some concluding remarks. And then we'll call this a very successful and great webinar. So Steve, could you okay. help us close here? Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. You know, um, as, as was mentioned, there'll be a lot more of these sessions that we'll be doing and we look forward to continuing the discussion um, to see what, what we can all contribute to in, and as we go through this period of what people call the transition. So again, I think it's just uh, the first one and um, we, we look forward to continuing the dialogue down the road. Thank you. Thank hey, you, Derek. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's Mike. I, I know we're, you're you're tight and you're wrapping up, but you know I, I just thought about something. You've gotten um, the Office of Fossil Energy to uh, help these programs get out and be out on the table, and and I, I would offer that we probably haven't seen the the ability to put voices out on these issues like this until uh, today. Correct me if I'm wrong. And that for fossil energy to uh, be supportive and create this platform is a big step. I, and and I, try, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking about that to myself. I'm like, wow, the, the ability for people to hear this is this, this, this is not this is not what we normally hear. We hear a lot of other stuff on the national platforms. And uh, you've got a you you've got a neat deal here that has given some voices out there that can be can be uh, distributed around as well. Just hats off to the guys over there. Yeah, and, and, and thank you. Yeah, hats off to the Partner of Energy and the Fossil Energy Group, and of course, your group, the United States Energy Association for helping us generate this discussion. And so, you know, for, for my company, the big thing that, that I'm interested in is you know, we have, and CJ pointed this out, we have our grandmas and grandpas, our elders and our kids on reservations. And, and it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out how to give them a bright future, a future where, you know, they have resources at hand, a future where they have access, you know, to, to food, to, to water, to homes, to education, Head Start, all those other things. And so right now, many, many tribes who, who have fossil energy resources benefit you know from taxes from royalties and so so the future right now is is a little bit bleak and so we're, we're hoping in, in the next five webinars that we do that we we get get a little bit more detail on some of the, the essentials like for example capital margo pro outlined the process for getting a permit through the bureau of indian affairs you know what does that mean what does it mean for trust responsibilities so with that, I just want to say thank you very much for, for joining us. And we apologize again for moving from Zoom to WebEx. And so I think we lost some of our, our viewers, but this, this series will be videotaped. So just, just a, a, a couple of additional concluding remarks. Our next webinar is on, on Wednesday, May 19th, again at 10 o'clock Mountain Time. And our, our topic will be uh, broadcast probably in a couple of days. Also, I just want to mention in an hour from now, the Department of Energy's uh, Tribal Energy Department, and I, I believe their uh, DOE Loan Program Office, they're having a, a, a webinar in an hour from now on capital access, access to capital for tribal energy projects. And so I invite all of you to join that if you haven't. And so with that, uh, Steve Gray and I thank everybody and we thank everybody for participating. And so for now, until two weeks from now, we wanna say thank you and a hat for joining us. And so long, everybody, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.